Jeffrey S. White presiding. <coughs> Good morning, everybody. Please call the case. Calling case number C-08-4373, Carolyn Jewell et al. versus National Security Agency et al. Council, please step forward to the podiums and state your appearances. Good morning, Your Honor. Richard Wiebe for the plaintiffs. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. Tom Moore, also for the plaintiffs. Good morning. Everybody can be seated. Be seated, please. Thank you. Except counsel, you can come on up. Good morning, Your Honor. Aaron Mackey for the plaintiffs. Welcome. Good morning, Your Honor. Andrew Crocker for the plaintiffs. Welcome, counsel. Good morning, Your Honor. David Green for the plaintiffs. Welcome. Good, you, good morning, Your Honor. Rodney Patton for the government defendants. Good morning. Also seated at the counsel table is Jim Gilligan for the government defendants, Julie Hyman for the government defendants, and uh, Jim Whitman for the individual capacity defendants. What's with all these guys? Where is, do you have any female attorneys in your? Only one. <laughs> okay. We had, All right. to we had to leave the other back at the office. Okay. Okay. All right. So um, we're here for this hearing uh, on the cross motions for summary judgment. And although I have published uh, some questions for counsel to answer, uh, and those will be the meets and bounds of this hearing, I don't want uh, Fourth of July speeches or regurgitating what's in your brief. Just answer the questions and you'll help the court make a just decision. But uh, given, given the, uh, uh, the, uh, the scope of this case and the important issues, I thought it would be appropriate for the court to uh, make a couple of, of comments as to where I see uh, where we are at this point, the state of the law, the state of the case, uh, and to give some context before we launch into the weeds with the, with the questions that the court has. So this case is one of many arising from claims that the federal government with the assistance of major telecommunications companies, conducted widespread warrantless dragnet electronic communication surveillance of United States persons following the attacks of September 11, 2001. The court and the parties are challenged to address the inherent conflict arising at the intersection of the individual's right to privacy and protection of civil rights weighed against the burden carried by the government to protect the national security. In order to provide this protection, the government must maintain secrecy over locations, sources, methods, and other operational details of its intelligence gathering activities. On September 18, 2008, plaintiffs filed this putative class action on behalf of themselves and a class of similarly situated persons described as mi millions of ordinary Americans who use the phone system or the internet and a class comprised of all present and future United States persons who have been or will be subject to electronic surveillance by the National Security Agency without a search warrant or court order since December 12, 2001. After many years of litigation and two appeals, this court must determine whether, as plaintiffs describe it, the content and metadata collection programs may violate plaintiffs' remaining statutory protections afforded them by the Wiretap Act and the Electronic Communications Privacy Act or the Stored Communications Act. The court is now tasked with the threshold question of whether plaintiffs can maintain their claims based upon both the public and classified evidence of their standing, despite the potential that continued litigation may imperil the national security. For their part, plaintiffs have submitted publicly available evidence and expert opinions in an effort to show that they have standing. Having found that the mechanisms under FISA, FISA Section 1806, preempt dismissal at the pleading stage, based on invocation of the state secrets privilege. The court has employed the FISA procedures extensively and has reviewed volumes of classified materials submitted by defendants in response to the court's order to marshal all evidence bearing on the issue of plaintiff standing as well as the publicly filed evidence. The court is concerned that it has reached the point at which further litigation notwithstanding the procedures provided by 1806F of FISA, 
Foreign Intelligence Securities Act poses a not insignificant risk of disclosure of national security information and resulting grave harm to national security. Even making a determination that this procedural posture regarding plaintiffs standing to sue may carry the unavoidable risk of disclosure of operational details of defendants' purported intelligence gathering activities. The court intends to hear the party's responses to the series of questions published in the record, including the impact of the Ninth Circuit's most recent opinion issued last month in Fazaga versus the FBI. The court has reviewed the additional authorities submitted by defendants. Lastly, the court intends to issue two separate orders, one in the public record and one which will be filed as a classified document and treated with all of the uh, safeguards that classified, uh, highly classified documents have. Um, and I will tell the parties uh, that even though the court has published uh, uh, questions in advance so that the parties can uh, prepare uh, to uh, address the court's questions and concerns, uh, please be prepared at the end for what I will call pop quiz questions, which were not on the take-home exam, uh, that arose in the court's mind after, uh, after I issued these questions. So I'm sure as well prepared as, and skilled as you all are, you'll find those uh, pretty easy to, to deal with. But we'll deal with those at the end. So uh, whoever's going to argue a particular question, uh, I'd like to have them come up, uh, and we'll start with the questions. And I think given um, the nature of the questions, um, uh, and the fact that uh, this um, proceeding is being uh, videotaped for, uh, for uh, possibly for showing on, uh, on TV later on, I will uh, read the questions into the record uh, so that uh, the, the record is clear for those who might be viewing uh, this, uh, this, these proceedings. So question number one. In his concurrent, and I'm going to leave out the citations uh, as being unnecessary and rely on the written document for that. In his concurrence in Obama versus Clayman, Senior Judge, Circuit Judge uh, Williams determined that plaintiffs lacked standing because, quote, plaintiffs lacked direct evidence that records involving their calls have actually been collected, unquote. Plaintiffs argued that they had standing based on the contention that the effective, effectiveness of the alleged surveillance program would increase with the expansion of coverage, even in the absence of actual knowledge that any specific communication of any particular named plaintiff was collected by the government. The judge disagreed, however, and found that the, quote, assertion that NSA's collection must be comprehensive in order for the program to be most effective is no stronger than the Clapper plaintiff's assertions, unquote, premised upon speculations and assumptions. So question 1A, for the, and I'll start with plaintiffs. On what authority do plaintiffs argue that this court's ruling should not adopt that reasoning that I just quoted? Thank you, Your Honor, and we appreciate the opportunity to be here today and address your questions. Now, there are fundamental differences between claimant in this case. We have much more evidence. We have different claims. We're in a different procedural posture with a different legal standard. Let's look at how claimant in this case differ. Claimant was a Fourth Amendment constitutional challenge to phone records collection. Section 1806 was never raised. They didn't have a statutory records claim, which would have triggered 1806F. And it was an appeal from a preliminary injunction. As Judge Williams notes, this meant that the claimant plaintiffs had to show, quote, a substantial likelihood that their records had been collected, and not just, as Judge Williams put it, the, quote, lighter burden, close quote, of defeating summary judgment by showing a genuine factual dispute. And that's at page 568. Now, the only evidence the claimant plaintiffs relied on was the inference that because the phone records program was large, their records must have been collected. Now, one judge, Judge Brown, concluded that this inference was sufficient to find standing, but that the claimant plaintiffs had not met the higher substantial likelihood burden of a preliminary injunction. Another judge, Judge Williams, also found that the claimant plaintiffs had not met the higher substantial likelihood standard for preliminary injunction. And then both judges held that the case should be remanded for jurisdictional discovery. Now we have three claims, our internet 
content interception claim, our phone records claim, and our internet records claim. These are all statutory claims for which 18 U.S.C. section 2712b4 provides and mandates the use of section 1806f's procedures, quote, notwithstanding any other provision of law, close quote. Now the procedural posture, as I said, is different. Plaintiffs are opposing summary judgment on standing. They need only show that there's a genuine factual dispute about standing in order to have summary judgment denied. Thus, we face only the lighter summary judgment burden and not the heavier preliminary injunction burden. And as in any case, we can meet this burden with either direct or circumstantial evidence or a combination of both that on the whole is sufficient to create a factual dispute. And I'm sure the court has told juries many, many times that circumstantial evidence is just as good as direct evidence. And a direct admission by the government is not required. Congress didn't make the government the gatekeeper of claims under Section 2712. Now we have much more evidence than the plaintiffs have, than the claimant plaintiffs did, including direct evidence. And we also have the secret evidence on standing that the court has ordered the government to produce. Now plaintiffs have direct evidence that their phone records were collected in the form of FISC Business Records Order Number 1010. Your Honor, may I hand up a copy of the document I'm referring to? Sure. Have, have you shown that to government counsel? Yes, this is an exhibit to uh, my declaration. Um, and for the record, uh, what what is that? Out, uh, okay, very I'll well. The citation. Uh, so this is exhibits A and B. It's actually excerpts from those exhibits. Um, uh, and that's ECF number 417-4. Uh, my declaration filed in connection with these proceedings. Now, Exhibit A is the uh, uh, FISC uh, phone records order, uh, number 1010. And uh, as I say, it's an excerpt of it. And it's, it's an order compelling providers to uh, submit call detail records, phone records to the government. Now, uh, as Your Honor will note, when we look at the first page of Exhibit A, uh, redacted are the names of the providers from the caption. Now, if, if we turn to Exhibit B, uh, what we'll see is a document that the government subsequently produced in FOIA litigation with the New York Times. And in that document, uh, there's a letter from the NSA to the FISC referring to this same business records order, business records order 1010. And this is the, I believe this third page of the excerpt. Um, does your honor see that? Yes, I do. Yeah. And in the caption of this letter uh, is a reference to docket number BR, business records 1010 at the at the end of the caption. And then earlier in the caption, there's a description of the order and the providers who were subject to the order. AT&T, the operating subsidiaries of Verizon Communications Inc. and Celco partnership doing business as Verizon Wireless and Sprint. Now, this is direct evidence that the government collected phone records from AT&T. Um, Judge Williams, in his opinion, categorized FISC orders as direct evidence. He characterized plaintiffs in other cases who did have FISC orders from their carriers as possessing direct evidence that phone records were collected. And this is page 565 of his opinion. Mm -hmm. We also have direct evidence that at and phone records were collected in the statements in the NSA draft Inspector General's report, which uh, I'm sure the court is familiar with at this point. That's ECF number 147, and also appears at ECF 432. And finally, if the government has fully responded to plaintiff's discovery requests, 
There will also be in the secret evidence actual phone records for the plaintiff's phone numbers. Judge Williams did not say that the plaintiffs needed their actual phone numbers, phone records to establish standing, but nonetheless, plaintiff's records should be in the secret evidence here. That is also direct evidence. There will also should be in the secret evidence other FISC orders, attorney general letters from the PSP period, FISC opinions, all identifying plaintiff's carriers as ones who submitted phone records of their customers. And that is also direct evidence. And there's also indirect evidence, including the broad scope of the program is disclosed in the PCLOB 215 report and the FISC pen register trap and trace order. Likewise, we've got evidence uh, on our internet content claims. Um, for those claims, I think it's important to know at the outset that in order to show injury to their internet communications, plaintiffs do not need to show that those communications were kept by the government in permanent storage. For purposes of standing, all we need is an injury in fact, and any interference with those communications, even if they're not permanently stored, is sufficient. And second, the interference does not need to be performed by the government directly. Anything that AT&T did that's fairly traceable to the government creates standing. Now, plaintiffs have direct evidence that the interception program is implemented by AT&T touched their communications. We have direct evidence of the splitters in San Francisco, which the court is well aware. Um, and the government even admits in their brief at ECF 421 at 13 that plaintiff's evidence is sufficient to show their own communications were copied by the splitter. And we have evidence showing that those communications were then diverted into the secret room for filtering and scanning. That's Klein's testimony and the AT&T documents. And AT&T's own security director, James Russell, confirms the authenticity and accuracy of Klein's testimony about those documents and the documents themselves. And in turn, we have the, the experts that Your Honor referred to, Brian Reed, Matthew Blaze, Ashkan Soltani, and Scott Marcus, explaining how this surveillance setup worked and why plaintiff's communications would have gone through these filters. <coughs> And importantly, I think they bring out that in order for the government to even figure out which communications it wanted to take, it had to reassemble the entire email, including its contents. And that process alone is enough of an interference with our communications to create standing. And this direct evidence dovetails with the other evidence, including the PCLOB report's description of upstream. Internet records, uh, I'll summarize briefly. We discussed this in our brief ECF 417 at 19 to 21. The government collected internet metadata for 10 years from 2001 to 2011. The FISC in the pen records and trap and trace order describes it as a massive program that's systematically over collected. FISC says it was quote, wholly non-targeted bulk production because to collect the metadata of an email, you have to reassemble the entire email. Collecting the internet metadata required the same sort of surveillance setup as AT&T used at Folsom Street. Now the government ended the program in 2011, destroyed most of the internet metadata at that point. We still believe that it's likely that our internet metadata is in the government's secret evidence, but if it's not, we've asked the court to impose a spoliation sanction for that. So why doesn't claimant apply here? First, the court doesn't even need to read that issue, reach that issue, because we have much more evidence than the claimant plaintiffs do, including the secret evidence the court ordered produced. We're, we are not proceeding solely on the theory that because the programs are big, they must have included plaintiffs. Secondly, Section 2712B4 and Fazaga are the controlling authority here, and they say the court must use the secret evidence to decide the case. And we 
believe that that secret evidence should definitively confirm plaintiff's standing for all three of their claims. Third, even if the only inference, even if the only evidence for our phone record standing were the inference about the size of the program, three different judges have found that inference sufficient for standing. There's Circuit Judge Brown in Clayman, District Judge Leon in Clayman, and District Judge Windmill in the Smith v. Obama case, which your court referenced, the court referenced in your um, Fourth Amendment order, ECF 321 at 6. And finally, in any event, Judge Williams did not decide the standing question on a genuine dispute standard. Instead, he was applying that substantial, higher substantial likelihood standard of preliminary injunction. So his decision is in opposite here. All right, thank you very much. Let me hear from you, Mr. Penn. Yes, Your Honor, I believe Mr. Wiebe has gone through um, questions one through five and touched on them, and I, so I will um, try to hit as many points as uh, Mr. Wiebe did. Well, I, I would prefer that you confine your answer as much as possible to the questions as they're put by the court, since okay. otherwise. I, I, I cer certainly will, I, just responding to his uh, points. First off, I think, uh, the answer to Your Honor's question is uh, yes, we think Your Honor should um, apply the reasoning. We look at this question as addressing the bulk metadata programs, that's the bulk internet and bulk telephony under both FISC uh, authority and the pres presidential surveillance program. The plaintiffs have no direct evidence, and I will run through the direct evidence that Mr. Wiebe alleges. The circumstantial evidence they have amount to nothing more than conjecture that is a big program. We're participants, our subscribers to a big provider, therefore you must have got our records. That's the bottom line on uh, the bulk telephony. They have even less evidence on the bulk internet metadata. Just to address first though, the question of the uh, standard, Mr. Wiebe is exactly correct that uh, the claimant case, uh, which we also handled, uh, went up on preliminary injunction, but the judges, the two judges, uh, at issue here, Judge Santel, um, who concurred in part, dissented in part, and Judge Williams, who your honor referred to, looked to the standard in Clapper and the so-called common sense inferences that the dissent in Clapper um, considered. Those were uh, no small matters, but the, uh, the two judges in the D.C. Circuit looked at the common sense inferences and, and saw these inferences, this conjecture, as no stronger than what was in Clapper. And that's very important because Clapper was actually on cross motions for summary judgment, and the court in Clapper found that those alleged common sense inferences, which were no stronger than those in uh, D.C. Circuit case and claimant, were not enough to create a genuine issue of material fact, and that's the standard that we have here. So that's why the court should look to Clapper and what uh, the court did in, in Clapper. Um, to address one of the things that, it, that is significant here, uh, Mr. Wiebe has looked uh, at two sets of evidence, one the unclassified evidence, one the so-called secret evidence. The, the classified evidence does not apply here. It cannot be considered under 1806F because 1806F does not apply to the issue of standing. It applies by the statute's direct terms and by FISAGA to only determine the lawfulness of the collection. So what we have here in this case is to determine the standing. Whether or not plaintiffs can even get to the issue of whether they are aggrieved persons and that 1806F is triggered for purposes of determining the lawfulness, we're not there yet. Um, but let me ask you this, so if, if, if you concede that 1806 is an appropriate vehicle under Fazaga and, and, and uh, by its plain terms, of essentially the merits of the case. I, Your Honor, I would not say the merits of the case because there are some components of the merits of the case that um, the plaintiff would have to prove in order for the government to invoke 1806F, such as they have to demonstrate they are in fact aggrieved persons. But, is, but, but uh, is there any authority uh, that says that the court cannot use 1806F for the purpose of reviewing uh, classified information to determine the issue of standing? The, the statute itself says that it's th the purpose of 1806F is to determine the lawfulness. Second, the Fazaga case, which we, we respectfully disagree with, but even under Fazaga, um, 
the Fazaga court says no fewer than four times that the purpose of 1806F is to determine the lawfulness of the surveillance. Secondly, the court in Fazaga emphasized no fewer than five times the, the purpose of 1806F is to protect national security. It, it called it a um, secrecy protective procedure. The way the plaintiffs want to use it here is exactly the opposite. They, they, would, they would use it to, uh, the effect of using it to determine standing would result in a classified fact coming out on the public record, which is whether or not plaintiffs were subject to surveillance. The way that we read 1806F and the way that the Ninth Circuit apparently did in Fazaga 2 is that its purpose is to determine, um, its purpose is to determine the lawfulness. If you just only look at the lawfulness of the issue and they have to demonstrate they are already subject to surveillance before you get to that 1806F procedure, you do not come to grief by determining a classified fact on the public record. Um, also, it, the, uh, we cited this case in our papers, the Wikimedia versus NSA case from the District of Maryland was decided in August of 2018. This exact issue, whether or not 1806F could be used to determine standing, whether or not the plaintiffs in that, or the plaintiff in that case, which was Wikimedia, could be uh, subject to surveillance. And the court emphatically said, no, you cannot use 1806F for that purpose. And I, I will just quote Your Honor, what, just one of the times the court indicated that. It was at page 780. Uh, Speaking of the microphone, please. Sorry. Thank you. Page 780 of the Wikimedia case, 335 F sub 3rd. Page 772, the pinpoint site is 780. 1806F procedures do not apply where, as here, a plaintiff has not yet established that it has been the subject of electronic surveillance. And that's common sense because the court cannot, under 1806F, determine the lawfulness of electronic surveillance if the electronic surveillance has not been established yet at all. Further proof for that is evident in the Fazaga opinion that Your Honor um, cited particularly page 40 and note 52 that indicates that the state secrets privilege can be asserted when the electronic surveillance claims fall out of the case or drop out of the case and the uh, only example the court uses on uh, footnote 52 is to say for example if plaintiffs cannot substantiate, substantiate factually that they were in fact subject to electronic surveillance in the first place. So the secret evidence falls out of this case. The state secrets uh, privilege entirely removes that evidence from this case, leaving only the unclassified evidence that, um, if Your Honor is ready for me to address, I can do so now. Yes. So Mr. Wiebe uh, referred to two, um, two types of evidence, direct evidence and circumstantial evidence. Uh, going back to the um, internet metadata and bulk metadata first. Uh, as far as the direct evidence is concerned, he mentioned two things. One, the um, so-called NSA letter, and we uh, addressed this in our classified papers, uh, both our declaration and our um, brief. Uh, as, as we said in our unclassified papers, we can neither confirm nor deny the authenticity of that letter, um, that whether or not that letter is uh, authentic is classified. Um, what I can say in the public record is this. Mr. McCraw, who is counsel for the New York Times, indicates at uh, paragraph 7 of his declaration that the document was, quote, inadvertently produced. If that is a true fact that the government inadvertently produced it, then the issue of the authenticity of that document and whether or not Your Honor can consider it is addressed by the Al Herman case uh, from the Fourth Circuit, and that's 507 F3rd 1190, at page 1205. And the facts of that case, uh, which I'm sure Your Honor is familiar with, are an inadvertently disclosed classified document does not waive the state secrets privilege over it. And the only difference here, if the document is legitimately produced by the government, and we can neither confirm nor deny whether it was, 
But if that document was produced by the government inadvertently, then it cannot waive the classified uh, nature of that document. The only difference between that set of facts in El Haramain and this set of facts is that in this particular case, if the plaintiffs are to believe, the New York Times did not honor the government's request to return it, and that cannot be the basis of a waiver of privilege. The second document um, that Mr. Wiebe talked about was the so-called draft OIG report. Um, we have asserted the state secrets privilege over that document. It was the subject of discovery requests, requests for admission 176, 177, and 178 by the plaintiffs. Uh, we objected on the state secrets grounds, and our position has not changed that whether that document is authentic or not is a classified fact. Uh, the plaintiffs have come forward with uh, a declaration by Mr. Edward Snowden, um, and uh, we argued this in our papers, but um, I, I will try and be brief. He's the one you call the outlaw expatriate? There are, there are a lot of phrases, Your Honor. Um, that I'm is sure one, there are that, from your side. <laughs> that is one of them. Okay. Um, we, our, our position is that he's not competent to testify about that. The uh, law on this case that we cited in our SIR reply at page one is that um, a witness to have, a witness under 901B1 of the Federal Rules of Evidence needs to have written the document, signed it, used it, or saw others do that. He did not. He indicates, uh, perhaps euphemistically, that he had, quote, access to it. Um, that is all he said. That is not enough as a matter of law. Second, uh, plaintiffs point to 901B7, that it was a public record, um, 901B7 of the Federal Rules of Evidence. Well, the, the counsel, uh, I don't want to interrupt you. I just did interrupt you, but I, I, I do want to interrupt you. But you, you. don't want to. I, I don't want to, but, but I've read that in your papers, and, and I appreciate your you know, pinpointing from your brief, but I'm really asking for specific responses that are not. And don't assume because um, I didn't refer to it that I didn't read it. I read everything. I read the cases, and I'm probably as familiar with this case as any other on the court's docket. So you don't need to repeat your evidentiary objections. Okay. Um, um, I, well, from, I'm very familiar with those. That's good. I will just move on to a, a particular point with regard to, um, so those are the evidentiary objections, and if, uh, if Your Honor found that Mr. Um, Snowden was competent to testify about those matters, then the next issue is whether or not they can present it in admissible form at trial. And we set out basically everything on that point in our papers, but it was in our sir reply because that's when it was a response to um, the filing that occurred in the prior brief. So we did not get the opportunity to respond to Mr. Um, or to plaintiff's sir reply. And the only point that I would add is that whether or not the court um, were to uh, allow Mr. Snowden to testify live under Federal Rule uh, Civil Procedure 43, whether it was a Debeni essay deposition, whether it was live video fed, no matter how it is, the State Department informs us that that would be an affront to Russia's judicial sovereignty, and we as officers of the United States would not be allowed to participate uh, in any uh, deposition that uh, did that. We might be accused of colluding, right? <laughs> you don't have to answer that. Go ahead. <laughs> I will take the fifth. Okay. Um, so that, that takes care of the direct evidence, the circumstantial evidence for Let's start with the bulk uh, telephony metadata. Um, the, uh, the plaintiffs point to, uh, and Mr. Wiebe points to, the uh, broad scope of it. Um, they, they say they have additional evidence. The additional evidence that they have here includes um, that letter. That letter was uh, in the record on remand uh, in Clayman, and it was not um, sufficient for Judge Leon to find, in that particular case, uh, a genuine issue of material fact. We, the, that case um, went back up again on uh, appeal only on the issue of Verizon Business Network Services. The Verizon Wireless issue did not, uh, was not successful in the district court again, and included in that uh, set of evidence was uh, the document that Mr. Wiebe says was uh, sent to the New York Times. Um, but circumstantially speaking, um, they have the, the, breadth, the, the breadth of the scope. Um, those are issues that were addressed by the D.C. Circuit, and the uh, Judge Santel basically said this is no more than 
a big program with big, uh, you're a subscriber to big uh, providers, therefore you must have got the records. And that, he said, was just conjecture. And they cannot base, uh, there's a difference between conjecture and a reasonable inference. And that was considered to be conjecture and no more, as I pointed out at the top, um, no more than uh, uh, the, the, uh, the facts that were present, the so-called common sense inferences that were rejected in, in Clapper, those were no stronger. Um, and in, in the dissent, and Clapper said, the government only has to be doing its job. That was at page 30, 431 of the Clapper decision. Only has to be doing its job in order to have got um, the communications in the Clapper case. There's not any difference here uh, in that regard. Um, I will say I forgot to mention that 2712B4 that Mr. Wiebe uh, pointed to was a, um, that does not change the 1806F analysis that we uh, addressed earlier. The 2712B4 says that it, it, that it applies to materials governed by this section, or by the uh, aforementioned sections. So there's no difference between 2712B4 and 1806F in that regard. They all apply, both apply only to determine the lawfulness of uh, the program. Uh, to talk about the bulk internet metadata, um, basically the plaintiffs uh, arguments uh, on evidence are cut from the same cloth as their bulk telephony metadata program evidence, except there's much less cloth involved. They do not, uh, it's basically this program was big, it got bigger, and it got bigger than it should. And uh, when they point to whether it's the FISC PRTT uh, document uh, that, that is in the record, they, it, it talks about the, the initial um, the initial uh, application of the, the uh, FISC program, then the expansion of the program and over collection. But the key to all of this is neither the plaintiff's fact witnesses nor their experts know where it occurred, how it occurred, who was participating in it. All of that is simple speculation and conjecture and that is not enough. Um, the moving on to the uh, internet content uh, that Mr. Wiebe addressed, he, he talks about, and we, he's correct that we did not contest the fact, the two facts, one, that Plinus Communications at some point went through the peering links at Folsom Street. Number two, that they were uh, subject to an optical splitter. But here's key, is for what purpose and for whom, and there's no difference today in 2019 than there was in Your Honor's decision in 2015 when you looked at all of this same factual evidence. Uh, Your Honor said in your, uh, on page four of Your Honor's 2015 opinion on upstream, which applies equally to whether or not it's uh, internet content under the PSP or internet content under upstream, that you looked at the entirety of the record. And having looked at the entirety of the record, you, held, you found that at page four, that the plaintiffs could only speculate about what data were actually processed in the secure room, SG3, and by whom, and how, and for what purpose. Absolutely nothing has changed. The, the plaintiffs have made new arguments about the same old evidence, and we've addressed those in our papers, and I'm not going to, um, again, go in through that. They're, they're new experts that they, um, that they uh, present, uh, Professor Blizz, Dr. Reed, uh, Mr. Sultani, um, they had absolutely nothing. They, they say that the equipment that was present there is quote unquote consistent with spy equipment or surveillance. Well, we are at the summary judgment stage. Being consistent with is not even enough evidence to get you past an Iqbal or Twombly at uh, Rule 12B, 12B6. So to say that whatever equipment was in there was consistent with that is not enough. And so Your Honor has already decided that factually in 2015. The, the plaintiffs are presenting the same evidence once again, and there's no basis for you to look again at uh, any of their factual uh, presentation. Uh, Mr. Wiebe also mentioned um, the content of uh, the internet metadata that was destroyed um, and that 
they seek a spoliation sanction. Your Honor's uh, June 2017 opinion, um, I think it's page five, addressed the issue. Your Honor has uh, looked at this issue. It's been on the public record uh, for years. And Your Honor said that absent a showing of bad faith or other relevance, Your Honor is not going to um, uh, give an adverse inference on that particular issue. And the reason that metadata was destroyed was in order to comply with FISC minimization procedures. And it was the internet FISC uh, authorized metadata, which at that time we did not realize was something that plaintiffs were uh, challenging in this case. And that issue has been briefed and briefed um, as to what actual programs were um, at issue in 2008. Uh, Mr. Wiebe also mentioned the Smith versus Obama case uh, in which a judge found that um, standing was appropriate based on the evidence that he's presented. That was in a footnote um, where the judge did nothing other than um, cite to the claimant decision. The claimant district decision was reversed and remanded based on the theory uh, at that time, the one adopted by the Smith case, that uh, the, the government must have obtained the uh, the bulk telephony metadata record or the bulk telephony metadata records so that that case um, uh, is not precedent for your honor um, any other cases such as ACLU versus Clapper involved VBNS the Verizon business network services that's the only provider identity for a 90-day period in 2013 that the government has acknowledged your honor knows we have consistently taken the position whether or not for any of these six programs that are now being challenged, um, that the identity of participating providers is classified. That is the one sliver of an exception for a 90-day period that none of the plaintiffs here are actually VBNS uh, subscribers. And uh, Admiral Rogers, who is the director of NSA at the time, um, indicated in his, uh, or swore in his declaration that the VBNS was, that acknowledgement did not cover any other Verizon component. Um, such as the Verizon components that plaintiffs are um, plaintiffs are subscribers to. I believe I've covered all the points all right. that Mr. Weeby All right, did. so Mr. Weeby, uh, I'll give you a chance briefly to respond, but I, I'd like you to, we're kind of uh, pushing together some of the, I think necessarily, some of the other uh, questions, but I would like you to respond to, to Part B, which asks, without any specific finding, finding that any specific plaintiff's communications were touched by the alleged surveillance programs at issue, how can the court find standing to sue? I, I've heard and, and certainly uh, you know, understand your circumstantial evidence, uh, and, and, and that's in the record, and, and you don't need to repeat that, but I, I'd like you to answer, if you can, that question, and then I'll give you a chance briefly to reply to government counsel. We certainly believe that both the direct and the circumstantial public evidence that we've put in alone is sufficient for standing. We believe when you combine it with what's in the classified uh, evidence that the government has provided, um, that, that that will remove any question at all about standing. And again, this is summary judgment. All we have to do is create a genuine dispute about the fact of standing. We don't have to, we're not seeking summary judgment on standing, so we don't have to prove standing. We just have to produce enough evidence from which a reasonable fact finder could conclude that we have standing. But is your bottom line uh, argument, Mr. Wiebe, that, uh, that the cases that the court alludes to and to which the government alluded to about, well, our communications must have been picked up because the, the program was so massive, uh, they must have used, uh, gotten into the backbone of, you know, the Verizon, uh, that you, you've just submitted more evidence and better evidence to go Certainly. beyond that. Because you have to concede that the law is pretty clear that this, you know, must have, should have evidence is not enough. Uh, most courts, just about every court has reached that conclusion. So, so your argument, as I understand, is we have more and better evidence. Yeah, certainly if the, if the court adopts that standard, that's our response to it. We still uh, believe that it's an open question, to say the least. We, it we may be, three, but I, I think it's above yeah. this court's pay grade uh, at this point. <laughs> okay. Uh, when we're dealing um, with Clapper and, and the Fourth Circuit and the D.C. Circuit and, and the Ninth Circuit. Go ahead. Well, the Ninth Circuit hasn't said that. I know. Um, 
And, uh, and there was one judge on the DC circuit that said, no, it is enough. All right. And, uh, but to, to get to your question. Yes. Your Honor, um, there is one thing that I did want to clarify in the, not in question B itself, but in the body of question one, there's a phrasing where the court suggests what may be something different, that is actual knowledge that any specific communication of any particular named plaintiff was collected by the government. And I just wanted to make clear that our position is we don't have to show that a specific phone call on a specific day or a specific email was collected. That is, there can be circumstantial evidence, there can be direct evidence that everything was being collected and that makes it more probable than not that, that we were incorporated in that. So I just wanted to, to make that clear. Right. You know, we're AT&T customers. If AT&T turns over all its phone records, that certainly makes it more probable than not that ours were in it. All right. And um, uh, but I, uh, obviously, there's a lot that the government uh, has just laid before you that uh, we want to respond to both here and in, in subsequent questions. Um, focusing on, on what they've said here, first of all, they challenge our direct evidence under the phone records program. Um, the the uh, NSA letter to the FISC, Exhibit B, which we, we've just all looked at. Um, the government seems to live in this fantasy world where if they sprinkle a little pixie dust, things which are in the public record suddenly disappear from the public record. And that's just not the case. The well, they're not saying that. They're saying that, that uh, it's, it's not pixie dust. It's, it's the claim by the government that acknowledging the authenticity of certain documents that have somehow gotten into the public domain, it's that admission itself uh, could, be, could do uh, grave harm to national security. But the but the government has already admitted that they produced this in FOIA litigation with the New York Times. The New York Times said the scope of the litigation was only NSA documents. The government comes back and says, here's an NSA document. That's all the court needs to conclude it's authentic. We've also got Mr. McCraw's testimony, the New York Times general counsel, saying, I conducted that litigation. The government called me up, said, here are the documents. They gave me the documents. This is one of the documents. That is, is more than sufficient to authenticate the document. Now, whether the government wants to take a position on authenticity or not is a completely different matter. They can remain silent. They can you know, give your honor secret explanations, as they apparently have. But that doesn't change the blunt fact that it's out there, it's public, and we're entitled to rely on it. And they can't shrink the scope of the public evidence by saying we don't like that, we don't think that should be in the public evidence. If it's public, that's public evidence we're entitled to rely on. Um, likewise, the uh, NSA Inspector General report. We've laid out uh, the uh, authentication, uh, uh, the reason, the grounds for authentication, both in our um, uh, in our reply brief and also in our serve reply. And I won't go through those, but there's more than adequate authentication. Um, and the, uh, you know, the speculation as to whether or not Mr. Snowden could testify in the future is not a grounds for saying this is not an authentic document. Um, the, so we've do got. You have, do you have any basis to believe that Mr. Snowden is willing to testify and subject himself to a U.S. jurisdiction? Has he told you that? We have not. Uh, there's been no request, and we we haven't. All right. So what basis do you have? You have the burden of going forward with respect to the evidence that Mr. Snowden would be available to testify, and thereby give the government a chance to cross-examine him. And as we've explained, there are procedures in Russia we, for remote testimony. In uh, Russia? We've laid out. All right. He would be in Russia, we would be here. All right. and, and both for deposition and for trial testimony, as we've explained in our papers. Right. I, I Those are, are perfectly feasible and possible right. alternatives. Um, 
the so we so as the court has pointed out, we've got a lot more evidence. Than I know, and, and and I don't want you to repeat what you said before. I mean, just because the government said it more recently doesn't mean I'm necessarily going to find it more persuasive. Because I'm going to think about all of your submissions. I understand, and all we right. have we have complete confidence in that, Your Honor. Um, the one other point about the the NSA letter we were looking at, they say it was uh, present in Clayman on remand. The thing that Clayman failed to do was put in Exhibit A, which was the business records order uh, uh, showing what was actually collected under that. And so we have both A and B. Clayman only had B. And, and you need both of them to make the complete story. And we, we have the complete story. Um, the uh, issue of 1806F, obviously, we'll have much more to say about at, at question three, just for now. Um, two points. Uh, Fazaga says once evidence comes in under 1806F, it's in the case for all purposes. Um, and we'll explain that in question three. And second point is 2712B4 is broader than 1806F and allows the use of secret evidence for any purpose. And we'll also address that in question three. Um, Clapper, uh, many, many differences between Clapper and this case. That was a future harm case. It was a case, a pre-enforcement challenge brought before the statute had actually gone into effect. Um, so by definition, the plaintiffs were speculating about what might happen in the future. They made no claim that they'd actually been subject to surveillance. They said, we may be subject to surveillance in the future. That's what was too speculative. And why was it speculative? Because unlike this case, they were challenging targeted surveillance. Our case, untargeted surveillance, mass surveillance, everyone gets swept in. Their case, targeted surveillance. Their theory of standing was, we communicate with people who the government is likely to target. Therefore, our communications are likely to be caught up if the government targets those people. That's not our theory at all. We're alleging untargeted surveillance. So we don't have that whole chain of speculation that they needed to rely on in a targeted surveillance case. And I'll have more to, to say about Clapper as well in the future. Um, the, one of the final things the government mentioned was your, your Fourth Amendment ruling. Um, we addressed this in our papers, ECF 417 at 17 to 19, uh, the reasons uh, why we believe that ruling was erroneous and why the court should take another look at it. Um, I'm going to leave it there so we can continue to move yes, on. Yes, let's move on. To, uh, and, and I'm sure, uh, uh, government counsel, you'll have more to say on these issues, but let's try to put them in the context of the questions. Now, again, to the extent that you've already responded to um, uh, the questions that the court will get, get into now and a little bit later, you don't need to repeat your arguments. Obviously, I can I, I understand. I just want to get your answers. It isn't as critical as it be in response to a particular question. But let's move on to question two. And I'll read the question. On appeal in, in Clayman versus Obama, the court reiterated the test established by the Supreme Court in Clapper. Plaintiffs, quote, cannot rest their alleged injury on bare speculation that their contacts abroad will be targeted simply because they reside in, quoting, geographic areas that they believe to be a special focus of the U.S. government. They were citing uh, Clapper there. Uh, quote, continuing the quote, instead, they must allege injury that is uh, currently impending without relying on a highly attenuated chain of possibilities. Similar to the appellants and claimant, plaintiffs here allege no more than they, that they communicate with various individuals in countries they imagine might attract government surveillance, unquote. So part A is, I guess this parallels the first question, on what authority do plaintiffs argue that this court's ruling 
should not adopt this reasoning. And again, to, uh, Mr. Wiebe, and, and also uh, for uh, Mr. Patton, to the extent you've already addressed this, you don't need to repeat it, but go, go forward in, in terms of anything new you want to add. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, the One of the important things to recognize is that, uh, as I said just a minute ago, Clapper was a targeted surveillance case. Now, this claim and decision is different from the one the court cited in question one. Correct. Um, whereas question one was dealing with an untargeted surveillance program, the phone records program. In this question, Cla uh, Clayman was challenging uh, the uh, targeted so-called PRISM program. Now, PRISM is a completely different uh, program from upstream. Uh, we don't have a PRISM claim here. Uh, the PCLOB report makes clear the difference between upstream and PRISM. Upstream intercepts communications directly from the Internet backbone while the communications are transiting through those circuits. And the PCLOB report, 702 reported at 124 and 36, which is uh, Exhibit B to the Cone Declaration, discusses this, and we discussed this in our brief mm -hmm. at, at 417, ECF 417 at 1112. And so in upstream, the government needs to touch all the communications going through these circuits and then filter and scan them to select out only the ones it wants to keep. PRISM is a completely different method of acquiring communications. In PRISM, the government asks communications providers to give them the emails directly sent to or from a particular account. So under PRISM, unless you are a target or are communicating with a target, the government never touches your communication. And the PCLOB 702 report, again, that's Cone Declaration Exhibit B, discusses PRISM at pages 7 and 33 to 34. So the claimant plaintiff's theory of standing for PRISM, like the Clapper plaintiffs, was that they or those who they communicate with were targets. And that's not our theory of standing for upstream. And their theory is that, our theory is that even though plaintiffs are not targets, their communications are still passing through these circuits that the government intercepts. And for that reason, they're subject to the processes that the government uses to to intercept, filter, scan, etc. cetera. Um, thus, I think it's, it's wrong to say, as the court does, that plaintiffs here allege no more than that they're communicating with certain individuals in countries they might attract government surveillance. Uh, it's wrong in the sense that we allege, we allege more than that. We've put in evidence of more than that um, and have proven more than that. Um, but it's also wrong because our theory of standing is not that we have standing because we're a target or the people we talk to are targets. Well, if I didn't understand that before, Mr. Weber, I certainly understand it now. Okay, okay. And um, there's also a reference in, the, in question two to the quote-unquote certainly impending standard of Clapper. Now, that standard doesn't apply here because that's a test for potential future harm, not actual past harm. And what Clapper says uh, is threatened injury must be certainly impending to constitute an injury in fact. And it goes on to contrast that with actual past injury. So the, again, Clapper was a pre-enforcement challenge, so it only alleged potential future harm and specifically future harm through this targeting <coughs> process. Um, so uh, certainly impending is not the standard we deal with here. And that site to Clapper was 133 Supreme Court at 1147. So the bottom line here is that the DC Circuit's analysis of PRISM, which is not a program at issue here, and of the claimant's evidence the claimant plaintiff's evidence that they were, or those they communicated with were targeted, really has no application on our facts and our theory of standing here. All right, thank you. you may respond, counsel. Yes, Your Honor. Um, 
So we read this question to apply to the internet content clams, the clams uh, under the presidential surveillance program and under upstream. And uh, Clayman does give you from 2019 that any evidence the plaintiffs have that they communicated with certain country, with people in certain countries, to the degree that they're looking at that fact uh, that, that the government may be interested in, for example, they, they list out various countries that uh, they've communicated with, to the extent that that is a fact that they look to to enhance the likelihood that they have been subject to surveillance, that is addressed by um, Your Honor's citation to the 2019 claimant case. Uh, Clapper is, I would disagree with uh, Mr. Wiebe here, is helpful here. He is correct that it was a uh, future injury uh, case that uh, certainly impending is the standard there. But what the plaintiffs need to show here is an actual injury. And the language of the standing cases are actual, not conjecture. And what we have here, whether you call it speculation about a future or conjecture that something happened in the past, they still have uh, conjecture only for their internet content claims that the government must have been doing something. And so they have. But would uh, you concede, though, I, I understand maybe the plaintiffs never get there. I'm, I'm saying this in the most hypothetical way because I don't want to uh, get into anything that, that I'm not supposed to get into that's classified, is if, if in fact the plaintiffs could show that their communications went through this uh, bulk collection um, uh, uh, process, the, the upstreaming, would that be sufficient to confer standing if they could show that? So what they need to show in order, I, I, I In other words, would I, that be a cognizable Article Three issue, uh, in injury? So for, I, I would only quibble with your reference to uh, bulk. Upstream is a targeted program. I know the plaintiffs. I right, forget that. The, the plaintiffs allege that. Forget they, that. You understand my point. My, my. I, I do understand your point. What the plaintiffs would have to show is the following: all of all, the the thing that they've shown is that their communications have gone through Folsom Street, that they were copied by an optical splitter, and then there's a dead end. And what they have not been able to show, and the facts are all classified, are the following: one. That AT and T. Well, if they're classified, do you really want to be talking about them? Well, uh, whether or not these are true is is okay. classified. These are the points that they would have to show. One that um, that the copying and redirection was done either by the NSA at the NSA's behest as part of the PSP internet content, or as presidential part of the surveillance upstream, program. Right, as part of uh, the upstream program at Folsom Street with AT and T's participation, and that copying, as they posit it, is uh, part of the upstream or presidential surveillance program's internet content, uh, the, the way that it works. And all of those facts are, in fact, classified. And they have not been able to do it either by fact or by expert. Their experts have added to the hearsay that Mr. Uh, Klein has added, they've added their speculation on top of it, which is, we think that if the NSA were doing it, they would do it in this certain way. And obviously, a trial on the issue of whether or not these experts think the NSA must be doing this, that, or the other is uh, a problem. But they, they have not said that the most they've said is it's consistent with or it's logical and unsurprising if they did it in this particular way. But there's no evidence whatsoever to support a nexus between the copying and redirection that they have indicated and the NSA's programs. And that's where they fall down. That, that they cannot show by unclassified evidence. And the ev whether or not copying is part of or ever was part of the NSA's program is a classified fact, the issue of which we've addressed in our classified papers. That's all I have. All right. I'll, I'll give you a chance to briefly uh, reply. I think I've, uh, you've given me the information I needed in the arguments, but if there's something new that the government uh, said that you'd like to respond to, Mr. Wiebe, then I'll give you a Thank you, Your Honor. There is. Yes. Um, the government just said that our evidence ends in a dead end. That's not true. Uh, all the stuff that's copied goes into the secret room. And the secret room is controlled by the NSA. 
and has equipment to filter and scan. How do we know that? Communications. We know what equipment is in the secret room. Right, but how do we know that? How do we know that? The, one one possibility is, eight, you know, again hypothetically, one possibility out there is AT and T is you know on a frolic and detour of their own, and they're doing it on their own, or they or they believe they're good uh, corporate citizens. I, th I think that's even more speculative than some of the accusations of speculation that the government has made against us. Um, it, anything is possible in this world, in this universe, as I'm sure Your Honor knows. Especially now. Um, huh? and, <laughs> and the question is, is uh, have we, uh, the question is not have we eliminated every possibility. It's, I understand. It's have we, have we gotten to that threshold of more probable than not. It's uh, how do we know the NSA is involved? First of all, we have uh, Klein's testimony of observing NSA uh, personnel coming and meeting with the people who control the secret well, didn't, room. Didn't the court already decide that that was not, uh, uh, that was not admissible uh, evidence? And, uh, I know you think I'm wrong, but, and maybe someday the Ninth Circuit will agree with you, but that is okay. sort of the law of the case, isn't it? Uh, Your Honor is free to reconsider that ruling, and we would urge that the court do so. Fair enough. Uh, we've laid out our, our reasons why that's admissible at ECF 429-3 at pages 10 to 12 and ECF 441-3 at, at 6 to 8, I'm sorry, 10 to 13 uh, for ECF 429-3 and 6 to 8 at ECF 441-3. and and we would be grateful if the court uh, took another look at that issue. Um, apart from the Klein evidence, we have the NSA Inspector General report, which also confirms AT&T's participation in upstream and the internet surveillance. And we've already addressed why that is admissible. Um, so that's two independent sources of, of evidence. Would Your Honor like me to go to Part B of the question? Yes, please. Yeah. The question is, without any specific finding that any specific plaintiff's communications were touched by the alleged surveillance programs at issue, how can the court find standing to sue? Yeah. Um, the simple answer is that we think the public evidence we've given you is enough for you to find that, that the communications and communication records were touched by the government's program. Um, we think the public evidence alone is sufficient. We think the uh, secret evidence uh, will confirm and support the public evidence. So that's our simple answer right. to that. Do you want to say, say anything, only, um, uh, counsel, only on point B? Um, I think you've already the, covered The two-word answer is it cannot. Okay, great. Um, I like brevity. It's <laughs> soul of something. Um, all right. Let's move on to question number three. And then after this question, we'll, we'll give staff a break and, and everybody. Another necessary element to establish Article III standing is the requirement that any concrete and particularized injury be, quote, redressable by a favorable ruling, unquote, citing Clapper. In order to issue a dispositive decision on the standing issue, a finding of standing would necessitate disclosure of possible interception of plaintiff's communications, thereby signaling injury. Such a disclosure may imperil national security, again citing uh, Clapper, and the quote is, the court's post-disclosure decision about whether to dismiss the suit for lack of standing would surely signal to the terrorist whether his name was on the list of surveillance targets, unquote. Any attempt to pr prove the specific facts of the programs at issue or to defend against the plaintiff's analysis of the programs would risk disclosure of the locations, sources, methods, assisting providers, and other operational details of the government's ongoing intelligence gathering uh, activities. So the question is, question A, if any finding or judgment is impossible without disclosing information that might imperil the national security, how can plaintiffs assert that their alleged injury is redressable? The First answer to this question is that it's law of the case that plaintiff's claims are redressable. The Ninth Circuit says, quote, 
Jewel easily meets the third prong of standing requirement, the redressability prong. Jewel seeks an injunction damages, either of which is an available remedy should Jewel prevail on the merits. Now that's 673 F3rd at 912. And the court is bound by that ruling that our claims are redressable. And even if it were not law the case, uh, we disagree with the court's redressability analysis here. The test of redressability is whether a favorable decision would offer the plaintiffs a remedy. And by the way, let me, uh, one thing I want to, I think it's appropriate because it's, I think inevitably you'll get into this. I'm going to read the second question too, because I think, which is, how can any potential plaintiff extract herself from this catch-22? Is there any way to challenge any alleged overreach or impropriety in the surveillance tactics employed by the government without eventually running into the risk that examination or resolution of the challenge would potentially risk national security. You may continue. Thank you, Your Honor. As I was saying, the test of redressability is whether a favorable decision would offer the plaintiffs a remedy. Clapper says redressable by a favorable ruling. So the, the, the question is, when the court asks whether an unfavorable decision, that is one dismissing our claims on state secrets grounds, would offer us redress, um, that's not the, the proper question. The proper redressability question. You like to quarrel with the court's premises, huh? I do. It's okay. It doesn't hurt my feelings. I, I understand you, right, thank and, I, you. and I appreciate that. All right, thank you. Not yes. every judge takes that attitude. <laughs> um, so the proper redressability question is whether a favorable decision deciding plaintiff's claims on the merits in their favor and awarding damages would offer them redress, and it certainly would. But the larger question, I think, is what the court frames in, in Part B, which is the court's concerns about the national security implications of a decision on the merits. Now, again, we don't think those are questions of redressability, but they are real questions for the court. Um, so let me address those concerns. Um, first of all, the, the court asks, how do you get out of this catch-22? Congress recognized the catch-22 and solved it by enacting Section 2712B4 and Section 1806F, as the Ninth Circuit made clear in Fisaga. Congress has struck the balance between national security and civil liberties. Congress has directed the court to use Section 1806F's procedures to decide plaintiff's claims. And Section 1806F allows and, in fact, requires the court to decide the claims on the merits, but without disclosing the secret evidence. And it's... But it's, doesn't that beg the question of... Let, let's just take it at a higher level, which is, okay, I, the court does what, what the plaintiffs are asking, reviews the, the secret evidence and says, uh, either yes, uh, they're standing, or on the, on the merits, I'll call it the merits of standing, or no, uh, there's no standing. The government's position is, and, and some of the courts seem to agree with this, that merely stating that fact uh, or f making that finding itself could have grave national security implications. How do you respond to that argument? The first response, and I actually had this in my notes before the court gave its I'll give you remarks, that credit. Yes. Was to, uh, I, need, I need everything possible going into the pop quiz. That's right. Okay. <laughs> You're doing very well, counsel. Yes. The, uh, the first thing in my notes was the possibility of a classified opinion, which I think your court has properly recognized. So uh, what the court has laid out is uh, on, on the public record, there would be a simple yay or nay. And, and all the reasoning and evidence and support would be in the classified opinion. And we do not think that that simple nay or gay is going to cause harm. First, the existence and the general scope of these programs is publicly known and admitted by the government. Um, it's not, uh, there's no dispute that there was a bulk phone records program. There's no dispute that there was a bulk internet metadata program. And there's no dispute that upstream exists. The government has disclosed it was collecting phone records and phone records from the largest companies and that it's collecting communications from the internet backbone. 
And as we've shown through our experts and other evidence, the only way to collect communications from the internet backbone is to start with everything and then start filtering and scanning to end up with the, the subset of what you really are after. And AT&T and Verizon disclose in their transparency reports, which we put in the record, that they participate in FISA surveillance. So there's no question that they are participating in it. So second, two of these programs have ended. So there's no longer any operational details, uh, uh, ongoing operational details relating to the phone records or internet metadata. And third, and perhaps most importantly, uh, unlike Clapper, a finding that the plaintiffs have standing would not disclose who the targets of surveillance are. That was the Supreme Court's concern in Clapper. Clapper was, again, a Fourth Amendment constitutional challenge to targeted interception of communications to and from specific individuals, not untargeted mass surveillance like upstream. And the theory of standing, as I said, is, was that in the future, the government would target these individuals, the plaintiffs would communicate with these individuals, and then be caught up not in mass surveillance, but in that very narrow targeted surveillance. And then what, let, let, let's, I understand that. Now, let's assume hypothetically that I agree with your position here, mm -hmm. uh, that I can, uh, that the national security issues can be dealt with in a classified opinion, and yay or nay doesn't really, uh, you know, help potential terrorists or targets or whatever. What would the contours of a trial look like? We'd still have to have a trial. Yes. And the question is, so would that trial be an ex party in camera trial uh, and, and how it, the government could not I think you would agree defend the issue of standing in a public trial because then they really would need to get into sources and methods do you agree with that it a trial on standing yes they first of all I do, I don't I think there's only a limited amount of uh, what they would need to show to to defend it um, uh, it's it's not like they have to bring in, um, uh, you know, someone to explain who they're targeting or why they're targeting a particular person. Again, targeting is all beyond the scope of this case. Um, but what would the trial look like? Much of it uh, likely would be ex parte in camera. We would, again, renew our motion for access as as the court knows, and as the Ninth Circuit called out specifically in its Fazaga opinion, uh, one of the provisions of 1806F is to provide, uh, uh, in the court's discretion, access to the plaintiffs. And, and we, we would seek that, and, you know, seek security clearances and all the proper uh, precautions. Um, uh, but you're right, much of, the, much of the trial would be out of the public eye. And, and uh, that's not preferable, uh, obviously. We would want as much of it to be public as possible, but uh, uh, that's the, the system that Congress has set up in 1806F, and we would, uh, we're prepared to, to try it on that basis. Okay. Anything further on this question, Mr. Wiebe? Um, I just wanted to emphasize again that that famous footnote for and Clapper, the focus is all on disclosure of who the targets of terrorism are. And, and there's no way that a yay or nay finding on standing would disclose anything about who the targets of terrorism are here, or the targets of surveillance, rather. Um, and finally, Clapper, the only uh, other thing I wanted to add about Clapper was it wasn't an 1806F or 2712B4 case, so there wasn't the option of these, uh, of uh, using the procedures that Congress has mandated should apply here. All right, thank you. Counsel? Your Honor, I will pick up where Mr. Wiebe left off and talk about Clapper uh, first. Um, he said it was not an 1806F uh, case, and that's, that's correct, but the origin of footnote four, the reason we have footnote four is because the uh, plaintiffs in that case suggested, why don't we 
have an ex parte in camera um, procedure where the court can decide the issue of standing. And the Supreme Court said no. Any post disclosure decision will demonstrate someone was a target or was not a target, and that is a classified fact. It makes no difference whatsoever that that involved the, the uh, classified fact of targeting versus what we have here, which is the classified fact as to whether or not someone was subject to electronic surveillance. They're both classified facts. So it's naive to assert that there'd be no harm to national security uh, on the one hand and national security harm on the other. In fact, your honor has said in his 2013 opinion at page 1103 that whether or not the plaintiffs in this case are subject to electronic surveillance is a valid state secret. And each time we have asserted the state secrets case and uh, the state secrets privilege in this case, we have asserted the state secrets over whether or not the plaintiffs in this case are uh, subject to electronic surveillance. And would your position, I assume, doesn't change? Uh, Mr. Wiebe argues that, wait, you know, let's get real. This, all, this information is already out into the public domain, and, uh, and, and it's such a big program that it, it would not give a potential terrorist any more information than he or she might ordinarily otherwise have because it's not adding to the wealth of knowledge that somehow they use the cell phone and, and all cell phone traffic, if, that, if that's the argument that the plaintiffs are making. What's your answer to that argument? So the answer to that argument is uh, twofold, one on facts and one on law. Um, the legal issue is, for example, in Jefferson, Jefferson and in El Haramein, the existence of something in Jefferson, for example, was the existence of the rendition program that was the Mohammed versus Jefferson data plan. The fact that there was a, re a rendition program was unclassified, but all the operational details about it were still classified, and that, that resulted in uh, the state secrets privilege. Factually here, we've got the director of national intelligence and the director of the NSA saying specifically that addressing the issue of whether or not plaintiffs have been subject to surveillance will cause exceptionally grave damage to national security. It doesn't matter whether your honor writes uh, a one line, yay or nay, or whether your honor writes a hundred page unclassified decision. The uh, intelligence community has spoken and they have said emphatically over and over again in this case, most recently in February of 2018, that addressing the issue of whether or not plaintiffs are subject to surveillance is a classified fact, and why that is. How much deference does the court must the court give to the intelligence community? Not everybody gives credit to the, our intelligence community. I, I, I'm aware, Your Honor. Um, the court is required to give deference, and that's uh, in all of the state secrets uh, cases to the intelligence uh, professionals. And the reason for that is, uh, with respect to Mr. Wiebe and with respect to your honor, you do not see necessarily the big picture. And the bigger picture, for example, is set out in paragraph 331 of Admiral Rogers' uh, most recent declaration that talks about here in unclassified terms, and there's more behind the redactions, but in unclassified terms, here's why um, identifying whether or not these plaintiffs who give no indication that they are you know targets of surveillance or anything like that but even identifying these plaintiffs of whether or not yes or no on each one of their their programs um, would cause uh, harm to national security and it sets out and it's basically the idea of selective disclosure if these plaintiffs come forward and we say you're not you're not you're not you're not um, and then someone else comes along and says, we can either, and our response is, we can neither confirm nor deny. Very soon, you get to the point where you realize this particular channel of communication is safe from government um, uh, electronic surveillance. This channel is not. And it doesn't take much to give our adversaries um, a leg up, and they watch these things very closely. So the government is uh, mandated to protect national security, and we have to look at the big picture. and. We have consistently asserted the state secrets privilege over yes or no on the issue of standing. Could you, could you please, I'm sorry, could you address the issue of, uh, if you have a specific argument about, uh, in question A, about the redressability issue? Yes. So um, I believe Your Honor's question is basically another way of saying, um, and Mr. Wiebe is, is correct with regard to the favorable 
uh, decision, but Your Honor can't give either a favorable decision or an unfavorable decision. It's just another way of saying Your Honor cannot decide the issue of standing on the public record. Um, and in 2013, Your Honor tasked the plaintiffs on uh, page 1112 of your July 2013. Well, I really wrote a lot in this case, didn't I? Yes. <laughs> two that yes. we like, two that we like. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yes. But in 2013, Your Honor said, I'm tasking the plaintiffs with the burden of trying to establish their standing without harm to national security. Almost six years later, the answer is still no. They have uh, gone to great lengths, but the answer is still no. And Your Honor has almost 200 pages of a classified de uh, declaration from Admiral Rogers thousands of pages of classified documents that your honor can look at and see why that's exactly the case, that they cannot show uh, that they have standing without harm to national security. Again, your honor found exactly the same thing with regard to the upstream program in 2015 and uh, in your honor's alternative holding in that particular case that the case could not proceed without risk of harm to national security. Because at trial, as your honor uh, pointed out, we would have to uh, look at how the programs work, which providers participated, where the NSA was conducting surveillance, who were subjects of surveillance. All of these issues uh, need to be decided, and there's no way Those to would do be that. done in private, though. The plaintiffs wouldn't be part of that. Well, Your Honor, at the very end, uh, well, two, two things. One, um, the uh, 1806F, by its terms, does not apply to determine standing. Two, nothing in FASAGA indicates that it should be, and indeed there's much in FASAGA that's, that tells you that it's for the lawfulness determination alone and also to protect national security. Let me ask you to address it, a point that Mr. Weeby made, which at least he's correct, that the statute uh, uh, contemplates that, uh, that a, a plaintiff's attorney could be uh, cleared to basically see the classified uh, information. Should the court, if the case goes further, even if it doesn't go further, uh, what's your position about whether the court should, uh, if you will, deputize one of the plaintiff's attorneys to be, uh, and, and have them clear to see this evidence? Well, first, nothing has changed since Your Honor has decided this very issue back in, uh, I think it was ECF number 404 in June of last year when Your Honor found and denied plaintiff's motion for access. Secondly, um, it, it would be unprecedented for uh, any uh, court to do such a thing under 1806F or 2712 before. It's not happened before. In one particular case, I believe in the Northern District of Illinois endowed a criminal case where liberty was at stake. Uh, the district court ordered uh, that the defendant's counsel be cleared uh, to see the information under, I believe it's 50 U.S.C. 1806 H. I think that is an immediately appealable order, and that was taken to the Seventh Circuit and reversed um, in a unanimous decision. That is unnecessary for the court to decide because if the what happens when these cases get just as an aside when they get on appeal, like to the circuit, can the circuit appoint somebody to see the evidence and contest the the court's classified opinion? Um, I'm not specifically aware of that in 1806F um, decisions, but in, in certainly on appeal, um, law clerks and judges are granted security clearances to see uh, information that's evident from the Jefferson opinion. But not example. in the district court, though. Um, I believe, we tried that, and I, we, were, we were shot down by, uh, by you guys. I, I, I believe um, a law clerk, a career law clerk, did review the... Well, uh, we, ha we do have one who, who, fortuitously, who happens to also work for a judge who deals with the FISA court, so... I, it was, I, I, and so I, I, it's my understanding that that particular... It is true. Uh, ...clerk not, looked at both the declaration and the thousands of correct, pages. Correct, correct. Okay, I'm but sorry. I'll, I, I I'll, don't want to get you off that's your, okay. your target here. Ult ultimately, um, ultimately, Your Honor, the end result of all of this, whether you cleared Mr. Well, whether you ordered that and whether the government looked at it and decided whether or not Mr. Wiebe had a need to know, because as Your Honor is aware, the decision whether or not to give out clearances is uh, uh, with the executive as opposed to any other branch of the government under the Department of Navy versus Egan. Uh, but even if Mr. Wiebe was cleared and everything related to that, Your Honor still cannot issue 
an opinion and order money to be paid, which is what this is all about at this stage, money to be paid, that very fact would reveal a classified. I understand your argument. All right. Um, but uh, one of the other, one of the cases that we cited to you in our additional authorities, um, that we cited in our additional authorities was Sterling versus Tenet, and it, it says at page 348, where the very question on which a case turns is itself a state secret, dismissal is appropriate remedy. And that's the very question that we have here. Whether or not plaintiffs were subject to surveillance is the classified fact. So you cannot proceed in that manner. The, uh, I, I won't belabor the point that um, of all the potential harms um, that could result um, from from a trial on the issue of standing as I've focused uh, more particularly on the one very fact that is uh, at issue here. Um, but I, I did want to address the catch-22. Um, so the, there are plaintiffs who would not be in this catch-22 and there are plaintiffs like these who are in the catch-22. So those plaintiffs who are not in a catch-22 situation are those where the government is officially acknowledged were subject to electronic surveillance. Now these can be uh, 1806 uh, plaintiffs, or I'm sorry, criminal defendants in a case where the government gives uh, 50 USC 1806C notice. Um, those, those criminal defendants, for example, if it goes forward and the, and the electronic surveillance is found to have been unlawful, well, they can become civil plaintiffs. And they, they do not have that catch-22 situation. There may be other issues involved that might preclude um, suit, but that would not be a catch-22. The same is for 18 U.S.C. 3504, which can apply in civil cases and deportation proceedings, etc. Though Those, and, and that is addressed in um, Judge Ellis's District of Maryland uh, opinion in Wikimedia as well, those plaintiffs who get notice and where the government comes forward and, and says, yes, we have, we have uh, subjected you to electronic surveillance, those plaintiffs are not in a catch-22 situation. Um, these plaintiffs are and cannot, and the Ninth Circuit has recognized uh, in the Kaza case, 133 uh, F3rd 1159 at 1167, that the results are in fact harsh. But the state secrets doctrine finds a greater public good, ultimately the less harsh remedy, to be dismissal. And in this case, in the Ninth Circuit, uh, all the way back in 2011, the, the Ninth Circuit said that the, the plaintiffs in this case might fail through evidentiary proof or procedural substantive barriers, and that their standing case might be doomed. And that is, in fact, true here. And the Supreme Court addressed this particular issue uh, of if not us, then who? in terms of standing, and that was in Clapper, in the context of electronic surveillance. They said at page 420, quote, the assumption that if respondents have no standing to sue, no one would have standing is not a reason to find standing. So that being the case, we obviously have told you some plaintiffs that don't fit into that catch-22. Your Honor also asked a, a follow-up question, which was about government overreach. Uh, I, again, it's, there's, there's some overlap in civil cases, those that I just talked about in criminal cases, those that I just talked about. But I also wanted to give Your Honor more of a um, framework for the FISC as well. So it's not just civil plaintiffs that could, under the circumstances mentioned, criminal defendants under the circumstances I mentioned. But in, uh, under the USA Freedom Act, um, 50 USC 1803I, allows the FISC to appoint amicus uh, to, in ex parte uh, situations, to present legal arguments that, quote, advance the protection of individual privacy and civil liberties. And that was added in, uh, to the FISA in 2015. Um, their sole purpose is there to try and uh, root out what is perceived to be government overreach or address those issues from a civil liberties perspective. Providers who receive um, directives under uh, FISA 702 also can challenge the lawfulness of the directive on a non-civil litigation way, the FISC 
also provides oversight for exactly those issues, whether or not it's government overreach or how it would be phrased, but the plaintiffs added the PRTT order that talked about overcollection in the PRTT sense. The, the FISC operates in that way, and uh, the Clapper decision at page 421 talks in a little more detail about that. Um, there's also congressional oversight of um, all of uh, the, the NSA programs involving 702 that are issued here and the others that were previously uh, addressed, semi-annual reports to Congress. The Department of Justice conducts oversight. So uh, whether or not these plaintiffs have standing does not mean that these particular programs, the one remaining one is upstream, um, that it goes unsupervised. What about the argument that Mr. Weeby made that, and then we're going to take a break because it's got, we've been going on for about an hour and a half, um, that to the extent that a program has been terminated and let's just, uh, what would be the harm to national security for the government to say, yeah, in that, in that old program, you know, uh, Mr. Weeby's clients may have been picked up. Uh, since that program is no longer going forward, he argues, right. why wouldn't that be an issue? Well, f five of the six, things stay um, classified even when programs end, and the reason why it stays classified and why, um, why that can still cause harm to national security is set out in our classified papers. Um, so I, 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 can't, no, no, yeah. I can't address them here, but that issue is, uh, is one that our classified papers do address, um, given the fact that five of these six programs have, in fact, ended. Uh, but I, I cannot explicate any further on Other that. Other than to make a representation that that subject matter... That, that subject is, matter is addressed. Wait, yes. don't interrupt. That, that question is, is, is um, addressed by the government in the classified information. You could say that much. Yes, Your Honor. All right. Um, I would just add that Mr. Wiebe uh, mentioned transparency reports, AT&T and Verizon. Nothing in those transparency reports indicates that AT&T and Verizon assisted in any particular program. They're particularly written so that they demonstrate no facts result that connect any particular provider to any particular program or any particular government entity. So those provide no uh, specifics with regard to uh, a nexus between those providers and any particular program challenge here. All right, well, let's take a break, and I'll give you a brief, very brief opportunity to uh, respond, Mr. Weeby, and then we'll move on to question five. So let's take about 15 minutes. Everybody can stretch their legs. Right. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor. All right, we're back on the record. So uh, you wanted to briefly, uh, if you wish, uh, Mr. Weeby, to reply with respect to uh, <clears throat> question um, 3B. Yes, Your Honor, thank you. Um, first, the government mentioned their supplemental authority, the Sterling versus Tennant case. Um, that was a disgruntled spy case like Totten and Tennant versus Doe. A spy plaintiff who wants to disclose secrets to prove a claim against the government arising out of employment. Um, that's, it certainly falls within the, uh, what the Supreme Court said in Tennant versus Doe, 544 U.S. at 3, quote, the longstanding rule announced more than a century ago in Totten prohibiting suits against the government based on covert espionage agreements. So that's not what's at issue here. It was also a, a so-called very subject matter dismissal um, because the very subject matter was a state secret. And the court has held that the very subject matter of this lawsuit is not a state secret. That's 965 F sub second at 1102.03. Um, but most importantly, it was a state secrets privilege case where 1806F and 2712 were not involved. Um, they didn't apply to those claims. And likewise, the Kazakh case that he mentioned is also a state secrets case. And here we have the court's ruling in 2013 that this is a case to which 1806F applies. Um, the, uh, along the same vein, he mentioned uh, Clapper footnote four, uh, where the plaintiffs had proposed a hypothetical in-camera proceeding. Again, there's a world of difference between plaintiffs making up a procedure on the fly and Congress uh, enacting a statute like 1806F creating a procedure. Um, 
the we also uh, talked about the the harm again I think the the crucial difference in terms of harm is targeted versus untargeted surveillance now uh, the government says that we have to prove we're subject to surveillance but that does not mean we have to prove we're surveillance targets because many many people were subject to these programs without being the targets of the surveillance um, and I think the court's clear on that distinction um, and again I don't think anyone who's followed these issues has any doubt that many millions of people were swept up in the phone records program and in the upstream program and in the, in the uh, internet records program and so the simply saying that someone who was not a target of surveillance was uh, swept up in the program I don't think really discloses anything new um, and finally those transparency reports of AT&T and Verizon are important and they are a disclosure that those companies are assisting the government in FISA surveillance and the government tries to minimize that and say well you wouldn't know what program they're in but I don't think that's the relevant question to a potential terrorist it's it's is the company cooperating or not um, uh, kind of the bottom line um, he also uh, said that it would be unprecedented to appoint uh, or to to clear counsel to clear plaintiffs counsel to participate in proceedings um, I would respond by saying that you know the government's sweeping evasion of, of FISA in the PSP and its violation of civil liberties on a massive scale is equally unprecedented and Congress has created this tool and given it to judges to to use in their considered discretion so simply because uh, it hasn't been used before is, is not an argument that it can't be used here um, he, uh, the government brings up uh, your 2013 and 2015 decisions and uh, what's changed since then uh, most most importantly I think is Fazaga which we're about to address and and it says despite all the alternative potential remedies that the government has laid out that plaintiffs have a right to proceed with their claims under 2712 uh, using the protective procedures of section 1806F. All right, well, let's move on to question number four. And I'll read the question, uh, the predicate to the question. Uh, in Fazaga versus FBI, the Ninth Circuit stated that, quote, section 1806F supplies an alternative mechanism for the consideration of electronic state secrets evidence that therefore eliminates the need to dismiss the case entirely because of the absence of any legally sanctioned mechanism for a major modification of ordinary judicial pre procedures, unquote. The court also specifically noted that section 1806 applies to quote unquote aggrieved persons defined in 1801K, 1801K as a per, quote, a person who is the target of an electronic surveillance or any other person whose communications activities were subject to electronic surveillance, unquote. The court did not rule out a renewed consideration of the state secrets privilege defense after 1806's procedures, 1806F's procedures have been followed. With this in mind, and this is question A, without any specific finding that any specific plaintiff is, uh, communications were touched by the alleged surveillance programs at issue, how can the court find that plaintiffs are aggrieved persons, quote unquote, such that the court is required to continue to, uh, quote, to use 1806F's procedures to determine whether the surveillance was lawfully authorized and conducted, unquote. So, Mr. Weeby, I'll leave that up to you. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Fazaga is an important decision for this case, obviously. Uh, Fazaga is absolutely consistent with everything the plaintiffs have told the court about Section 1806F for the past decade. Now, the Ninth Circuit reached three conclusions in Fazaga. First of all, 
Section 1806F displaces the state secrets privilege and prohibits any state secrets dismissal in electronic surveillance cases like this one. Second, a party is an aggrieved person entitled to use Section 1806F if the party makes well pleaded allegations of electronic surveillance. And third, once Section 1806F is triggered, the secret evidence is in the case for all purposes. Now let me go through these in a little more detail. The first point, the Ninth Circuit says over and over and over again that Section 1806F is mandatory and exclusive and displaces any state secret dismissal. And we see this at pages 17, 18, 21, 22, 23, 24, 27. And the government is wrong in suggesting that the procedures on remand section at the very end of the opinion leave open a state secret privilege dismissal of electronic surveillance claims. Now this is important, so I want to go through this in detail. Now the Ninth Circuit there was talking about a state secret dismissal of non-electronic surveillance claims, the so-called religion claims. Again, we remember that in Fazaga there were two categories of claims that the plaintiffs had, electronic surveillance claims and non-electronic surveillance claims, which the Ninth Circuit called the religion claims. Now the procedures on remand section begins at page 38, and it starts by discussing the electronic surveillance claims, and it directs the district court on remand to use section 1806F to decide the electronic surveillance claims. Now then at page 39, the Ninth Circuit moves to a different subject, the Fazaga plaintiff's non-electronic surveillance religion claims. And first, it rejects the government's argument that Section 1806F's procedures and the evidence that comes through it can't be used to decide the religion claims. It says, no, once it's in the case, it's in the case, go ahead and use it. And it, it holds that the secret evidence should be used for for both purposes. Then at page 40, so that's page 39, page 40, still talking about the religion claims, the Ninth Circuit says that if the electronic surveillance claims drop out of consideration because the plaintiff fails to prove them up, then the government may be able to raise a state secrets privilege defense. Now that state secrets defense can only be against the religion claims because by definition, the Electronic surveillance claims have already dropped out of consideration. So that's what the Ninth Circuit's talking about. And it makes no sense that at the end of the opinion, after repeatedly saying 1806F is mandatory and exclusive and displaces any state secrets dismissal, that it would offhandedly contradict itself and say, no, actually, you can do it. Now, the government has also cited footnote 52, which I want to bring up. And that footnote does not limit the plaintiffs. To, it, it talks about whether or not the plaintiffs have, have proven up their surveillance claim, but it does not limit the plaintiffs to using only public evidence in proving the claim. And it does not bar the court from using secret evidence reviewed under section 1806F to decide standing. And to the contrary, the entire thrust is once the secret evidence is in the case, it's in the case for the all purposes. And, I, and again, section 2712B4 was not at issue in Fazaga, and it has an even broader view of the use of secret evidence. So that is the first point, which is the preclusion of state secrets dismissals by 1806F. The second point, the agreed person <coughs> test that Fazaga uses. So Fazaga discusses agreed person twice at page 9 and page 28. First at page 9, it's discussing it to determine whether the plaintiffs have alleged electronic surveillance. At second time at page 28 to determine whether the plaintiffs are aggrieved persons entitled to use section 1806F. And at page 28, it asks, quote, whether FISA's 1806F procedures may be used in this case, and holding that plaintiffs must satisfy the definition of an aggrieved person. And then it cites back to its earlier conclusion 
that the plaintiffs have adequately alleged that they were aggrieved persons. And on the basis of those allegations alone, the, plain, the Ninth Circuit holds, quote, plaintiffs are properly considered aggrieved for purposes of FISA. And then the remand order at page 38 confirms this because it says to the district court, on remand, use 1806F. It doesn't require the plaintiffs to make any further showing or proof before the district court uses 1806F. The remand instruction is use 1806F. But Fazaga was a, was a, a, a pleading stage case, correct? It, it came up on a motion to dismiss. Correct, okay, which, which was true in uh, you know, the Jewel v. NSA, the 673, Fed 3rd, 902, the Ninth Circuit's decision um, in 2011. Um, and so let's, let's assume that uh, the court, the, the, stat, the status of this case, not, not assume, correctly assume, has gone further, and this court now has reviewed the evidence. And let's assume the court disagrees with uh, the plaintiff's characterization of the quality of its public evidence and finds that it doesn't, they fail to show standing. Uh, and the court has already uh, actually followed, the court must have been prescient because it did follow the 1806 uh, procedure in this case. So if the court were to make that determination, uh, wouldn't and, and, and find, just in the hypothetical, that the plaintiffs had not proved standing and could not prove standing, uh, that they were grieved persons. It's game over for the plaintiffs, right, at this level. If the court does not consider the secret evidence? If the court only considers the public evidence and finds that that's inadequate, and uh, therefore the plaintiffs have failed to carry their burden to show that they are grieved persons, isn't it game over at that point? If on that, the standing if, issue. If that's the court's ruling, but we would disagree with of that course you would. procedure. Of yeah. course you would. Yeah. But, but you, you admit that this case has gone further uh, and has actually gone in the direction that Judge Burzon contemplated in that the court did follow the, eight, the 1806 procedures, did review all the evidence, did order the government to marshal the evidence. So we've already, we're past that point, aren't we? I don't think so, Your Honor, um, and this is why. I think the court is required not only to review the evidence, but use it in reaching its decision. Now, as I understand what the court has just said, it's positing a scenario where the court has looked at the evidence, but doesn't actually use it to determine standing. And uh, we think that's not what Fazaga contemplates. We think that's not what 1806F contemplates, and not what 2712B4 contemplates. Mm -hmm. And the while Fazaga did arise on a motion to dismiss appeal, the reason, uh, first of all, you've got explicit remand instructions on what happens at the next phase, which is the phase this case is at now. So it's speaking directly to uh, how a court should handle the next phase of, of litigation post motion to dismiss. And in fact, the whole reason for, dismiss, for reversing the, the dismissal order was uh, the district court hadn't, can, hadn't properly recognized that 1806F provided a, a path forward post-dismissal. All right, so the bottom line is, your, the plaintiff's reading of Fazaga is uh, the court should do what it did, that is to say, review the secret evidence after ordering the government to marshal the same, Mm -hmm. uh, and then should make a determination, uh, both, uh, both an analysis of the, of the um, classified evidence as well as the public evidence, and basically, as we were using the parlance before, say yay or nay on standing, based upon the totality of the record. That's, that's how the plaintiffs read Fazaga. That's how we read Fazaga. And do you read Fazaga further to say, going back to the point that we were discussing before, which is if, the, if that, even giving that answer would, uh, if the government through its uh, uh, national security apparatus said, you know, you cannot tell the world yay or nay, uh, you're saying that Fazago would basically supersede that and say, no, 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 read it narrowly to say you cannot dismiss a case based upon 
state's secrets, um, the state secrets doctrine. Is that essentially what you're arguing, that the court cannot do that? I, I think a state secrets dismissal is absolutely forbidden, yes. Even on the yay or nay question? That's how you read Fazaga? That, uh, certainly, yes. Uh, uh, as I understand, the court is saying, uh, is contemplating a decision where it would say, state secrets forbids me from saying yay or nay. Is that yes, right? that's the hypothetical. And your argument would be, Fazaga would, would say that would be reversible error to do that. Fazaga, as well as 2712b4, which I don't want to lose out because it is actually a broadening uh, of 1806F. It wasn't at issue in Fazaga, but it's, it's, uh, it, it makes clear that uh, uh, 1806F's procedures govern the use of state secrets evidence for any purpose, including standing. Okay. Yeah. All right, anything further on that question? Um, not on that point. I, I, um, but I think it, I don't know if the court wants me to address the questions A and B. Yes, why, why don't we go and go, and I'll give, I'll give the government a chance to respond because I think, um, uh, and, and I think C is also gets into this question, but in B, the court asks, in Fazaga, the Ninth Circuit noted that the plaintiffs had sufficiently alleged that they were, quote unquote, aggrieved persons to survive a motion to dismiss their FISA cause of action under a, Section 1810, whereas here it may be that plaintiffs do not have admissible evidence to demonstrate that their communications were touched by the alleged surveillance programs at issue and that any classified evidence tending to show whether or not their communications were touched cannot be relied upon in the interest of national security, what light does Fazaga shed on whether this court may now dismiss plaintiff's claims under the state secrets privilege? So that's kind of what we were discussing just now, I believe. Yeah. So have you made your argument on that point? Um, on A, I, with respect to the agreed person issue, I wanted to make the points first that we have satisfied the Fazaga aggrieved person test, which is a well-pleaded allegation test. Second, we've gone beyond that because we've actually put in evidence showing uh, we've been surveilled. And third, section 2712b4 does not have an aggrieved person threshold for using eight, section 1806f's procedures. Um, on B, we've already gone over it, uh, I think, um, Fazaga forbids any state secret dismissal period. It says that over and over again without qualification. We've explained the language in the remand order. And uh, again, 2712b4 broadens the use of, of state secrets evidence for all purposes, including standing. And I don't know if you wanted me to address C as well. Why not? Let me read that, and then we'll, we'll, get, we'll get all the, so we don't have to sort of parse this. So yeah. is it not the case, this is the question C, that anything other than dismissal at this stage would signal that the surveillance programs at issue touched plaintiff's communications, which the government asserts would do grave harm to national security? Does Fazaga provide any guidance on how this court is to proceed any further under Section 1806F or otherwise, and does this fact does the fact that this court has reviewed the evidence on standing and now addresses the claims at summary judgment and not at the motion to dismiss stage distinguish the matter from, from Fagaza and Jewel v. NSA, this case uh, before, 673 Fed 3rd 902. Now you may respond. Fazaga, as I'm sure the court aware, is aware, um, goes through a, a lengthy and extensive examination of the legislative history of 1806F and explains the depth in which Congress examined this problem and struck the balance between national security and civil liberties. And in a sense, it's, it's relieved the court of that burden because Congress has said, this is how these cases should proceed forward. We realize there are our interests and risks on both sides, this is how we, the Congress, strike the balance. And the balance was to have the, uh, the, the claims and the cases go forward 
but under a, a very restrictive procedure, which potentially excludes the plaintiffs from having all the normal due process rights that they would have in an ordinary civil case. And that was the balance <coughs> that Congress struck here. And, and the Fisaga case recognized that and, and made clear that, that that's the balance the courts have to follow. And so when, when the government does assert harm to national security in an electronic surveillance case, Congress has said, no, don't dismiss it as, as you would under the state secrets privilege, but instead use these procedures. We believe these procedures are adequate to protect national security. And I think we've already discussed the fact that even the procedural posture here uh, Fazaga was a forward-looking decision, looking to what happens after the motion to dismiss, which is exactly. But I'm, I'm hung up on some. I'm, I'm still hung up on something here, which yeah. is this. So, the government has represented on the public record that they have presented in camera ex parte and classified documents along re, uh, many reasons and evidence with respect to why, yay or nay, would be would violate uh, would, would do grave harm to national security. So. Are you saying, so let's take that very, very narrow issue. Are you saying that the court is not free to say, okay, I'm required to give under all these cases deference to the intelligence community, or to say, no, no, I'll overrule that and say, no, I am required under Fazaga by a panel ruling of the Ninth Circuit uh, to disregard the concerns raised by the intelligence community. So that's really the issue, the, what I'm struggling with. Yeah. The, the way we see it, Your Honor, is that you're not disregarding those concerns. If, if you completely disregarded them, you would have a, a public trial, uh, it would be free reign, everything would be open, just like a normal case. Right. Rather than disregarding those concerns, what you're doing is taking those concerns and channeling them in the way that Congress has told you to do it, which is ex parte in camera decision making. And it, again, that's highly irregular in the Anglo-American legal tradition, as we all know. And uh, so it's, it's not a, a disregard or a defiance of, of the executive, but it's, it's using what the executive has told you, accepting their assertion of harm, and then doing with that assertion what Congress has instructed you to do, which is uh, conducting ex parte in camera. Okay, let me, let me let me let me play de uh, play devil's advocate. So, okay, I do that. I did that. Right. I, I, uh, and, and you're right. It's very uncomfortable for a court, an Article Three court, to sit there and not have the plaintiffs, you know, uh, whispering in their ears. Uh, so I so I let's say So I did that. And let's say my conclusion is, you know what, the government is right based upon all the secret evidence. If 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 a yay or nay decision is given. Uh, that's going to cause grave harm. What do I do then? What does Fazaga tell me to do at that point? I think Fazaga tells you to use the evidence to decide the claims before you. Um, and a decision requires a decision. And, uh, you know, we've talked about... But are you saying that... This, I'm sorry, but I'm really focused on this point. Yeah. Are you saying that that decision cannot be any more under Fazaga? I agree with the government's argument based upon the, my 1806F analysis that yay or nay on the issue of standing of the, each of the plaintiffs uh, would do grave harm to national security. We disagree with that. We do not think that the outcome of this process can be a state secrets dismissal. All right, so you answered my question essentially in the affirmative that even in that hypothetical context, the court is precluded from dismissing it. That's correct. All right. I, okay, I understand your point. Yeah. All right. Anything else you want to say on this? Uh, not on this point. Okay. Yet. Let's let's let me hear from you now. I, I, I see you're bursting at the seams there. So uh, <laughs> to respond. So uh, what is it? I right? was trying not to appear to be. No, no. I, I was only kidding. I wasn't even looking. I, I was focusing on Mr. Weeby at this point, and he was bursting at the seams too. But but so what is going to the last point? Does Fazaga now essentially read out of the court's you know toolbox? the opportunity or the, 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 the power to dismiss a case based upon state secrets, having gone through the analysis that Judge Berzon says we need to go through? 
No, Your Honor, nothing in 1806F, nothing in 2712B4, and nothing in FISAGA takes that away from you. And the reason for that is 1806F, both the statute itself and in FISAGA, over and over and over again, four times they say that 1806F is to determine the lawfulness of the surveillance. Not standing, which is the issue that we have here, or whether or not plaintiffs are aggrieved persons, that is a condition predicate both to, as Your Honor pointed out in 1801K, that is a condition predicate to whether or not 1806F is invoked. Same is true for 2712B4. Mr. Wiebe keeps referring to it as a broader statute, but the actual language of 27B, 2712B4 says that it's applicable uh, 1806F procedures, quote, shall be the exclusive means by which materials governed by those sections may be reviewed, and those sections, one of which is 1806F. The materials to be uh, reviewed there by the court are those going to lawfulness. So it's always 1806F for purposes of lawfulness. And Fazaga is very clear on that four times. It talks about that, even when it talks. Uh, What's the a, doctrinal reason for that? That's, that seems like a distinction without a difference. If I'm the sorry. courts, so in other words, if the court's reviewing the documents for one purpose, you know, lawfulness, isn't it assumed that the court, in order to get there, needs to determine from the secret evidence whether the parties or whether the plaintiff is aggrieved? Is that is there any doctrinal reason, uh, policy reason for that, or legislative history reason for that? So both 1806F and 2712B4 talk about any person who is aggrieved. So it applies only when someone is aggrieved. And for reasons that I will get onto momentarily, the plaintiffs have not demonstrated, A, that any of their communications have been touched, much less that they are aggrieved persons. And it's only aggrieved persons that can then ultimately trigger the uh, the uh, use of 1806F procedures. If it were any other way, as plaintiffs have said, the court comes to grief, and the grief it comes to is any decision will result in the revelation of classified information. But didn't Fazaga say if it's a well-pleaded allegation of standing, that that's sufficient to get the plaintiffs over the hump? So Fazaga, as Your Honor pointed out, was decided at a motion to uh, dismiss stage. Uh, on page 9, it says the complaints allegations are, su are sufficient if proven to establish that plaintiffs are aggrieved persons. So we would absolutely agree uh, with Fazaga that at the motion to dismiss stage, they had clearly pled that they were aggrieved persons, but that's not sufficient to demonstrate they're aggrieved persons. The motion to dismiss on the summary judgment stage, it's time to show the evidence. And the evidence here on the unclassified uh, sense is not only were they not uh, have they not shown that they were touched by any of the surveillance? They have not shown that they are aggrieved persons. Without a showing that they are aggrieved persons, 1806F 2712B4 doesn't, is not even triggered. So as a result, you can't use the classified evidence to determine standing or to determine whether one is an aggrieved person. Because if you do, those, those facts are then revealed. To, to take it to another, another example, if there was no dispute here, and this may indeed be the case at, um, in Fazaga on remand because I believe the FBI was looking at various other um, uh, tips that were taken in Fazaga and to determine how much more could be revealed. It may end up being in Fazaga. We don't know that there, there is no dispute that, there, that the plaintiffs there were aggrieved. That is not the case here. There is, an, there is a dispute over whether or not the plaintiffs have demonstrated that, they're, that they are aggrieved persons. As a result, you cannot use 1806F to determine standing. If you do, you end up demonstrating uh, a classified fact. But if you take the example that, uh, let's say the, the plaintiffs in um, Fazaga can demonstrate that they are, in fact, aggrieved persons through unclassified uh, means and that the government does not contest the fact that, they're, uh, that they've been subject to electronic surveillance, then under Fazaga, you would just go ahead and determine the lawfulness of uh, the surveillance against those aggrieved persons. But that's not the situation you have here. The situation you have here is that plaintiffs have failed to demonstrate that they're aggrieved persons, and nor as a matter of statute, uh, either 1806F or 2712B4 or FISAGA, 
does any of them say you can use uh, those uh, ex parte procedures to determine standing? Because if you do, you will reveal a classified fact, and that's the, that's the difference. Uh, I, my um, colleague um, reminds me that I'd be remiss if I did not say that the government is considering seeking rehearing uh, on banc. That decision has not been in Fazaga. That decision has not been made yet. It would be made by the Solicitor General. My understanding is in the last day or two, um, there's been a motion for extension of the deadline from April 15th for that rehearing petition to change to May 15th. And we're happy to. Um, Keep your honor posted on what the, the government decides to do in that matter. Um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Weeby mentioned again the uh, 1806F and its displacement. I, I, I've repeated, I think, various times that it applies to lawfulness. Its displacement only um, applies to, to um, the issue of determining lawfulness. Uh, the predicate to that is whether or not they have standing or whether or not they're aggrieved persons. I guess the, the answer to, to, you didn't answer my question, but I'll answer my own question. How's that? So my, the answer to my question is there's a difference in terms of potential impact on national security about whether the court says this program was unlawful as opposed to uh, these people, these plaintiffs, were, in, were or were not aggrieved, were, not, were, were or were not intercepted, because that would reveal a fact making a, a determination of lawfulness would not, would not reveal any uh, classified information. Is that, is that basically the answer to the question? That, that's exactly right. My apologies if I did not answer um, Your Honor's question, but that, that's exactly right, and it obviously depends um, on how uh, a judge in that particular case writes the opinion, but if, it writes the opinion, if the court writes the opinion on lawfulness without revealing a classified fact, then yes. The determination as to whether or not something is unlawful um, would not necessarily reveal that. That, that happens with, um, it, it's not frequent, but it happens when in uh, Section 702 cases the government uses in a criminal case um, some uh, information that's derived from electronic surveillance. They, the government provides notice under 1806C. The plaintiff files a motion to suppress under, I believe it's 1806. Yeah, I'm, f I'm familiar with that. He, and the, uh, as a result, the, the court says, yes, that surveillance was lawful, or no, that surveillance was unlawful. But the, the evidence that's given, the evidence that's governed by 1806F or 2712 uh, before is the evidence to determine lawfulness, not whether or not the plaintiffs were aggrieved persons or subject to surveillance in the first place. That's the evidence that look, that's looked at, and there is an evident way to make that determination on the public record, as opposed to here, determining whether or not the uh, determining whether or not the uh, plaintiffs were subject to surveillance is the classified fact that cannot be put in the public record. And just just to reiterate, the five times the Fasaga Court talked about how 1806F is uh, meant to protect national security, using 1806F in the way that the plaintiffs are suggesting would harm national security. And that cannot be what the, st the statute means, and it cannot be what Fazaga uh, intended. All right. You want to say anything in reply? I do. Um, first of all, as we explained, the aggrieved person test is an allegation test for all the reasons we explain on page 28. Um, the court's distinction without a difference point, that is, can you use uh, the uh, secret evidence for standing as well as merits? Um, Fazaga makes clear that once the case, it's, once secret evidence is in the case, it's in there for all purposes. It says it, it, as to, it parallels your court's, the court's reasoning uh, in saying that it makes no sense to try to compartmentalize the use. Um, that's at pages 27 and 39. Um, this notion that you could have a judgment on the merits that somehow would not uh, disclose whether or not the plaintiff had been subject to surveillance um, uh, is is not correct. If you if you find the surveillance is unlawful, uh, you can only do that in the context of a particular plaintiff's claim, and so you're necessarily finding, as part of finding that the plaintiff was unlawfully surveilled, you're finding that the plaintiff was subject to surveillance. You can't make a hypothetical finding that if the plaintiff had been subject to surveillance, it would have been unlawful. So 1806F clearly contemplates 
at the end of the day, decisions on the merits that will necessarily disclose whether or not the person has been surveilled. And the protecting national security is not the only value of 1806F. It's not the only value it advances. If it were, it would be an absolute bar on bringing any of these cases. It would just say, any case alleging unlawful surveillance shall not proceed. And clearly, Congress wanted these cases to go forward. That's why it carefully crafted this procedure. And that's why the case should go forward. All right, let's go to question. Your Honor, may I very briefly? Very, yeah, very briefly. Um, we're running out of time. One with 2712, it, doesn't, it would not need to read that these cases can't go forward. It would read these cases where there, uh, the question of whether or not plaintiffs are subject to surveillance is a classified fact. Those cases cannot go forward. The cases that I earlier indicated uh, where plaintiffs did already had an official government acknowledgement that they uh, were subject to surveillance, all those cases could proceed. Um, I, I would like to just mention two other quick things. One is, I, I, again, the if proven are two very large uh, words, the if proven on page nine with regard to allegations. That, that was not necessary for the uh, decision in Fazaga on a motion to dismiss, but it is absolutely key right here, and plaintiffs have not proven that they are uh, aggrieved persons. So is it, is, it, is, is it if proven by plaintiffs, or if proven by all the evidence, including that which the court reviews under 1806? So it, it has to mean pr if proven by the plaintiffs, because any other uh, reading of 1806F um, is, would reveal classified information, which is that plaintiffs were subject or were not subject to surveillance. So it has to be that plaintiffs demonstrate that ahead of time. And it's in the statute as a condition predicate. This is all laid out by Judge Ellis. Right, I understand that. All Judge right, has been, and so I just wanted to give your honor two pinpoint sites that I was unable to give earlier with regard to deference to uh, the executive with regard yes. to, um, with regard to uh, Classified matters. One is the Al Haramain case, 507 F3rd 1190, at page 1203. It says, But our judicial intuition about this proposition, whether or not Al Haramain was a specially designated terrorist uh, group, this, our judicial intuition about this proposition is no substitute for documented risks and threats posed by the potential disclosure of national security information. The other site is the uh, Muhammad versus Jefferson data plan case, which is 614 F3rd 1070 at 1081-82 that says, in evaluating the need for secrecy, we acknowledge the need to defer to the executive on matters of foreign policy and national security and surely cannot legitimately find ourselves second guessing the executive in this arena. All right, well, I don't want to go for it. No, I, I don't need any more on this. I want to go to question number five now. I have, I have all the information and all the arguments that I need. So let's go to question five. What are the party's positions post Fazaga on the plaintiff's request that this, uh, that this court reconsider its earlier ruling on the motion to dismiss the Fourth Amendment claims? Is the evidence marshaled by the government on plaintiff's standing claim I'm sorry, I'm, let me read that again. Is the evidence marshaled by the government on plaintiff's standing pursuant to their statutory claims, the same as would have been provided pursuant to the claims under the Fourth Amendment. So I'm going to put that to the government first. Okay. Uh, the answer to the first question, question A, uh, in two words, is no need. Um, and the reason for that, Your Honor, is that uh, 1806F does not displace um, the state secrets privilege, Your Honor, in that case, in the Jewell decision of 2015, looked at the unclassified evidence, found it wanting, and ruled that the classified information with regard to standing was out of the case. Same arguments I've made all along about using 1806F to determine standing still apply here. So that's number one uh, with regard to Fasaga. Number two, um, the Fasaga uh, decision uh, put a judicial gloss on the notion of valid defense. Um, and indicated that it would, uh, that it needed to be legally, merit legally meritorious and prevent recovery for the plaintiffs. Um, Your Honor did that already in the Jewell case. 
in the uh, 2015 decision because Your Honour looked at in its alternative holding on page 5 that the government's defence with regard to standing was, quote, persuasive. So as a result, there's no need for Your Honour to revisit its prior decision in Juul. With regard to question 5B, the one word answer is yes. Uh, the classified evidence relating to standing as the plaintiff's Fourth Amendment claims uh, is a subset of the materials that we produced to you on the issue of statutory standing. Um, Basically, the record ultimately would be the same. Uh, uh, in fact, it would be, it would be more um, uh, enhanced in, uh, with respect to Fourth Amendment from the government's position, but there's no new evidence that the court has not already considered which would, that, which would inform the court with respect to the Fourth Amendment. Is that what you're saying? Th that's correct, Your Honor. Um, had, had you ordered us uh, to marshal all evidence uh, with regard to the issue of standing uh, in 2015 on the upstream claim, you would get the same subset of evidence with regard to upstream that Your Honor received uh, in 2018. All right. Mr. Weeby. Uh, certainly, Fazaga holds that Section 1806F applies to constitutional claims, so I think that's a, a clear direction that uh, the Section 1806F process should apply to plaintiff's uh, Fourth Amendment claim. Now, the court in 2015 did not use the Section 1806F process, so I think the court should redo that decision using the 1806F process. Um, as to the adequacy of the uh, evidence produced by the government, obviously we have not seen that evidence, so uh, we don't know if it's a, really a complete marshalling on either the Fourth Amendment claims or even on the statutory claims. So we're we're in the dark as to as to that question. All right, fair enough. Uh, we're done with the the reported questions. Now we're getting into the pop quiz mode here. So. Maybe you want to bring out your heavy artillery here, but no, these are really, some of these questions have actually been uh, addressed, but, uh, and I, I wrote these questions um, before I had the benefit of your uh, excellent argument. So the first one is, um, is there any report, I, I read all of these cases, and, and, and Fazaga certainly is the newest, and it, it talks about, it uh, has a long um, direction to the district court, what to do on remand. But is there any reported case in which the court has not ultimately dismissed the case, a case involving alleged illegal surveillance by the government, based upon the government's invocation of the state secret privilege? It always seems that these cases come out the same way at the end, which is some district court says the case can't go forward, and the, and, and the, and the, the appropriate appellate court, um, if it is appealed, um, uh, affirms the, the district court. So it's just as a matter of curiosity, has there ever been such a case that you found, Mr. Wiebe? Not one that's gone to uh, final judgment. I think there, there are still some cases the government probably knows better than we do that are percolating through the, through the system. And I think what, I think what uh, distinguishes our case, again, is the fact that we have evidence that other cases don't have. And that the court has gone through the 1806F process uh, in ways that other courts have not. So this court has a much richer and deeper body of evidence to base its decisions on. And it also has, obviously, the, the, the mandate of Fazaga and, and the statutes to go forward with that process. Fair enough. So let me, w w uh, uh, you handle a lot of these cases. Is, is, and then this is not going to be dispositive. It's really right. uh, informed curiosity on the part of the court. Your Honor, we're not aware of any that doesn't end with a state secrets dismissal. Um, the only one that's out there that's anything like the Jewel case right now, other than I, I believe the first Unitarian case that you're uh, also handling, is the Wikimedia case in the District of- Oh yes, there's that, right? <laughs> yes, okay. That's after lunch. That's right, thank you. The, yes. uh, the only other case that we're aware of that's uh, still percolating is the Wikimedia versus NSA case. That's in the District of Maryland. The uh, docket number is 15. CV 662, oral argument on the issue of standing, very much like what we have here is scheduled for April 5th. Um, and uh, Judge Ellis, who's handling that case, um, has, as I noted earlier, uh, issued a, an opinion indicating that 1806F cannot be used for standing. So did, did, did Judge Ellis in that case 
do an 1806 review uh, like the court did in this case? No, he did not um, consider um, anything uh, outside of the unclassified evidence. He looked at the state secrets declarations that the government filed but did not look beyond the state secrets uh, assertion. He found the state secrets assertion proper and ruled the classified information out of the case. Well, let me pig piggyback on that for a moment. Is there any reported case in which the, or even any case, in which the court has gone as far as this court in actually reviewing the evidence under FISA section 1806F relating to electronic surveillance? I, I'm not aware of any case that has that the court has um, conducted such a searching, uh, tailored and specific review, review of the evidence that Your Honor has and, and getting, uh, seeking marshalling all evidence and looking to see if there's any way plaintiffs can determine their standing without harm to national security. All right, do, do, you, have, do you have any reason? To... Well, I think it's, I think it, it, it'll certainly happen in Fazaga. Yeah, I was going to point out uh, that's the road Fazaga is going down on remand. Um, obviously, in criminal cases, courts have have per proceeded through the 1806F process. Uh, I and, think. And, and they do that after the United States has given an official acknowledgement that electronic surveillance has occurred. And the other, uh, as far as Wikimedia goes, we address the Wikimedia case extensively in our papers. We do. And we take a different uh, view as to, as, as to uh, what Judge Ellis has said. He has are, not, are you counsel in that case as well? No. All right. No, we're not. All right. So uh, the, uh, the last um, pop quiz question I have is this: uh, accepting uh, for the hypothetically or for the uh, for the moment, the pl uh, if the court would accept the proposed procedure by the plaintiffs, that the court do an, uh, proceed to the, uh, decide the standing question based upon uh, the secret evidence, but more importantly, decide the merits question uh, of the lawfulness of the programs. Uh, the question for the government, is there any additional evidence? Uh, again, I'm not asking what it would be, because that would be, could be classified. Is there any additional evidence that the def defendants could produce or, or adduce that would go to the merits of plaintiff's statutory claims beyond the evidence already submitted related to plaintiff's standing? Yes, there, um, as far as I know, there could be a lot of additional evidence and a lot of different legal arguments as to whether or not um, that 2712 claim could be made out, for example, whether or not an interception has occurred within the meaning of the wiretap. Um, uh, there are various legal arguments that would have to occur before any merits decision, and I have to consult with my clients All right. whether I or not. I, I, so, so I lied. I have one more question for you, Mr. So what, so what procedure, I mean, uh, what procedure would the plaintiffs, if they had their druthers, uh, and assuming the court made a finding based upon the secret evidence on standing, would you envision, based upon what the government just said, the government then submitting, taking its next shot as far as merits uh, information, merits arguments, and then somehow, in some way, the defendants would, the plaintiffs would then uh, would then be able to uh, argue the illegality or the merits of the program? I think it it would start off at least as a process very similar to what we've just gone through over the past year since the, the last case management conference. That is, it would begin with us propounding additional discovery, the government responding to it, um, uh, marshalling, perhaps the court ordering it to marshal the evidence on the merits. Um, I think there would be uh, an even stronger argument for, at that point, letting plaintiff's counsel into the process uh, in terms of, of reviewing and weeding through the evidence uh, uh, in order to assist the court in, in its judicial function of deciding the merits. All right. Do you want to say anything further on that? Yes, Your Honor. Um, basically, Probably gives you uh, goosebumps hearing, hearing that letting uh, we be I, in on, uh, I, the, on, the, on, the, on the secrets, huh? I, I'm not sure goosebumps cover it. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. But it would basically be kicking the can of standing down the road, and that road would be littered with potential inadvertent disclosures, classified information, years worth, presumably after we had two years worth of discovery just on the issue of standing, years worth of discovery, ex parte presentations, um, and all for what? Because the court still cannot decide the issue of whether or not standing 
uh, exists, whether or not planets were subject to surveillance in the first place. Gotcha. All right. Um, uh, okay. That's. Uh, I, I have nothing else. I assume uh, we've covered everything. Uh, unless anybody's burning to put anything else. Uh, we don't need any closing arguments or Fourth of July speeches. Only the court gets to make those speeches. <laughs> uh, but thank you very much. And I hope to see some women arguing next time, if that's possible. Thank you. Thank you, Your well, thank Honor. You, Your we Honor. appreciate the time. Thank you.